Good morning and welcome to Elam Chapel on this beautiful, extremely hot Sunday morning here in the Southern California area. To those who intended, to those who are Zooming, and to those who will watch this on YouTube, pray God's blessings upon you in the days ahead. My message this morning is coming out of Mark chapter 4, particularly verse 39, but I will be reading from verse 35 to the end of the chapter. So it's Mark 4, verse 35, through the end of the chapter, focusing on verse 39. Reading. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were, no, there were also other boats with him. A furious squirrel came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to the disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Back to verse 39. He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the waves died down and it was completely calm. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for your word. We pray that you would speak to our hearts, that no matter how great the storms may be that life brings, we will see that you are Lord of all. Pray that you would bless, you would move, you would encourage, that we would be at peace in the midst of the storm versus panic. Pray that we would see that you are Lord of the storms, no matter how great they may be, how frequent, how long that you are the one that controls the storms in our lives and that we are in your hands and eternally safe and secure. Pray that you would bless everyone hearing this, that you would touch them and encourage them and ask it in Jesus' name, amen and amen. So this sermon actually comes from a song that was sang in the 1970s from Ann Murray and a band called Ocean, called Put Your Hand in the Hand of the Man Who Stilled the Water. And um, it is the inspiration for me on this message that I am speaking this morning. So I'd like for you at some point to listen to the song. It's, it's a folk song, um, but it has a lot of truth in it about who Christ is. So let me give you the history of what's happening this morning. The disciples and Jesus are at the Sea of Galilee. They're about to board a boat to go across it. But what you need to know about the Sea of Galilee is that the Sea of Galilee, even though they call it a sea, is really just a really big lake. And it is located in northern Israel at the foothills of the Golan Heights. And it's north-south in its direction. On the east, there are mountains. And on the west, there are the Judean hills. And so the winds come down this corridor of mountains and hills really abruptly. You could be out fishing, and it looked like a beautiful day. And the next thing you know, you're in a raging sea that, that is about to swamp your boat. And there's probably not many places on this planet that we see such a dramatic change of weather where you could go from calm to an instantaneous storm of seas of five, six feet, seven feet. And later on, there's another story of the disciples being in, in a storm where Jesus walks on water. But in this particular story, Jesus is actually in the, in the stern, which is the back end of the boat, on a cushion, taking a nap. And so it's very indicative to us that it probably is a real tough day Jesus is tired, and the 12 disciples and him board this little boat to go across the sea. And as they're traveling, up comes one of these notorious storms, 
and the water gets so rough, the wind is so hard that they think that the boat is going to be swamped by the storm and they're going to sink and drown. It's very fascinating to me because a lot of people will really, you know, get upset with the disciples about this. But I remind you that four of the disciples were fishermen. They knew about the sea. They knew about the weather. They knew about storms. So if they're concerned, then I'd probably say that the land lovers, you know, the people that are not fishermen, would probably have a right to be afraid. It would be like me taking people who've never been out on a Navy frigate or destroyer and throwing them into the North Sea and one of those famous North Sea storms. And their land lovers who've never been out there before, they would be freaking out. I can guarantee you they would be freaking out. As the ship is on its side and you're actually walking off the bulkhead because you can't walk on the floor. And so it is a bad storm. It is not some light little storm. It is one where even the fishermen are worried that they are going to drown. And scripture says that they go and they wake Jesus up. Now, the Bible only says a few words, you know, such as um, a uh, master, you know, uh, uh, don't you care? We're going to drown. And I'm pretty sure there were more words spoken. I'm pretty sure it was shake Jesus. It wasn't touch Jesus. Hey, Lord, how are you doing? Did you have a good nap? The weather is a little bit rough right now. And we really would like to see you resolve this. No, I think they were panic stricken, just like we get panic stricken. And they went to him and, hey, don't you even care? We're going to drown. And that includes the four fishermen. And what does Jesus do? He just looks at the wind and the, and the, and the oceans that are going crazy, and he tells them, peace, be still. And instantaneously, the winds died down and the ocean died down. Now, I don't believe that it just happened around that little boat. Because there were other boats out there. That's what scripture says. So there was probably a convoy, a convoy of boats going across the sea. And here we go with um, this massive storm. And when Jesus spoke it, that storm died everywhere. And so when you think about that, when you think about the storm, because this is a direct spiritual correlation to you and I having storms in our lives, when God calms the storms down in our lives, it impacts other people in our lives. And that's important for us to catch. This is not just some local little event that affected one little boat with 13 people on it. This was a, an event that honestly um, impacted everybody on that sea. The storm died. Uh, you know, kind of reminds me of the nor'easterness that we used to get in Maine, or they still do get in Maine. And imagine this nor'easter is dropping 8, 9, 12, 14 inches of snow. The wind is horizontal. You can't go outside. It's cold. The wind is actually making it through all your shingles and everything into your home. And the rain is being blown into the cracks. And imagine... Jesus speaking, storm be still, be at peace, and throughout the entire state of Maine, that nor'easter dies like that. We're not talking a subtle die, the wind died down, the sea died down. We're talking the absolute power of an awesome God that controlled the weather. And at this point, the, the disciples are frightened, not about the storm anymore, but about the one who calmed the storm down. And, and it's fascinating because Jesus says, you know, hey, look, don't you have faith? And remember the last couple of weeks I've been speaking about faith. It isn't the amount of faith that you have. It's do you have faith? And so here we have a situation where they seem to have lost their faith. And now Jesus calms it down, and they're frightened because they finally realize who he really is. He is the Son of God. And yet, they had seen him deliver people, heal people, and do miracles. But there's a real difference between you seeing Jesus heal somebody 
and Jesus feeding 5,000 and him taking control of nature. Because we have all heard the expression, Mother Nature. You can't control Mother Nature. Well, I need to let you know something. God controls Mother Nature. And the Son of God controlled Mother Nature. In fact, to be honest, if Jesus would have said, be still, be at peace, to the entire world's weather pattern, it would have happened. Not just at the Sea of Galilee, it would have happened throughout the Mediterranean, the Atlantic, the Pacific. It could have happened anywhere. We're dealing with God. And we're dealing with a God that can calm the storm. So from this analogy or from this story is where we learn today, not just about weather out there, but we learn that the storms of life that we all encounter can be calmed by the God who controls all things. And if you'll remember that God has you in the palm of his hand and nothing can happen to you outside of God's will, then you can be at peace in the greatest storm because storms are going to happen. Write that one down. Storms are going to happen in your life. They happen in everyone's life. The issue is how you respond to that storm. Do you respond with peace or do you respond with panic? Are you at peace or are you at panicking? And so, you know, here he looks at them and says, do you still have no faith after all that you've seen? And, you know, I thought about that long and hard as I developed this message. That even though I've walked with the Lord for many, many, many years, there are times storms come that I'm not expecting. And that's how storms operate. They didn't have Doppler radar. They didn't have the weather channel. That catches me and my faith is shaken by what the event is. And sometimes there's storms that I've never encountered before. And we'll talk about the different types of storms in just a moment. And so Jesus could look at me at times and say, Gregory, where is your faith? Because in the midst of the storm, beloved, we all are looking at the storm. And we need to look at the Savior who is in the midst of the storm. And it reminds me of the story in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel, when the three Hebrew lads were thrown into the fire, they saw a fourth, and the fourth was the Son of God. So even in the midst of that fiery storm, there was Jesus, if we incarnate Jesus. And in the midst of your storms, there is Jesus. Are you looking to Jesus? Or are you looking at the storm? And if you look at the storm, you're going to be frightened and scared, and your faith is going to ebb away, and you're wondering if you're even surviving. I mean, think about it for a moment. Let's get really logical. Do you really think God would have allowed that boat to sink with the Savior on it? Hmm. And if he did allow the boat to sink, don't you think all 13 of them would have floated and walked on water? I mean, come on. We're dealing with God's plan. The storm cannot circumvent God's plan for your life. The storm cannot change God's plan in your life. You're the one that changes God's plan in your life, not the storm. So the boat could have sunk, and they would have just all walked across the waters. Nothing was going to happen to God's plan. Satan cannot, cannot, repeat, cannot change God's plan for you. Only you can. And so he asked them that question. And, you know, they're looking at each other going, who is this? Even the wind obeys him. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Who is this? I mean, come on. It's Jesus. I mean, they've been around him. But it was a new revelation to his power and to his personage. And so to some degree, we have to honor that and understand it because we're no different. I mean, how often have we in our Christian walk seen God do something and all of a sudden we're like, uh, who is this? Because we've never seen it before. So 
Be open to understand that God is sovereign and in control of your life. That God is sovereign over the storms of your life. Be at peace. Because again, like I told you earlier, you have a choice. Peace or panic. And before you sit there and you go, oh, I never panic in a storm, then I will look at you and say, then you've never been in a storm. Because every one of us at one point or another have been in this place. So what is the problem then? I mean, what is the problem when it comes to storms? Ah, I have an answer for that. We become fearful when the storms of life threaten us and the waves threaten us because we, listen carefully, we think we're in control. So to all you control nuts out there, and I know a few, it's when you think you're in control and it's beyond your control, you freak out. Okay? We think we can save ourselves. We think we can fix the problem on our own. We think we have all the answers. We think it all hangs on us. And we are always keeping one hand on the rudder, even though God's in control. So if you really want peace in your life, let go of the rudder and let God be in control. It isn't upon you. It's upon him. It's not upon your name. It's his name. It's not upon your character. It's his character. And it's not upon your power because whatever power you have is from him. In other words, let go. So all you control people out there, let go and let God. And God will give you the peace that you need. Otherwise, you're going to panic. You're going to stress out. You're going to become grumpy and grouchy. You're going to become really a mean-hearted person because you're not in control and it's not happening the way you want. And it is so fascinating to me that when we were little children, mommy and daddy were in control. And, you know, sometimes they did a good job and sometimes they didn't. But God is the perfect father. He is Abba Father. And in the Aramaic, that means daddy in full control. Let me repeat that to you. Abba Father in the Aramaic means not just daddy. It means daddy in full control. Let me repeat that. In full control. In case you missed it, let me say it again. In full control. Now, your brain is saying, I understand that. You've said it a few times. You don't need to say it anymore. But I'm going to say it one more time because it needs to get from your head to your heart. He's in full control. Not partial control, not some control, not maybe control, not 90% control. He is in full, 100% control of your life and my life. And that means he's in control in the midst of the greatest storms of life, no matter what they may be. Some of you listening to this, some of you even here, are in a storm. And you need to recognize the one who is with you. And that is Jesus, the son of the living God, the one who saved you, the one who loves you, the one who at the end of all things is going to be your Lord forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and again ever. You and I both need to get it through our minds to our hearts. He's in control and he loves us. He's not going to let our boat sink. And if they sink, we're just going to walk on water. He's in control. So we need to recognize that there are different types of storms that take place. One is called situational storms. These are the storms where circumstances are against you. You know, Murphy's Law. You go out, you, you're all dressed up, and you get ready to go, and you got like 15 minutes to get out, and all of a sudden the dog bolts out the house, and you got to go find your dog. That is a storm because now you're late to whatever, wherever you're going. These type of situational storms just show up. You know, it, it just happens. Uh, and, and in that sense, you can't control it, but you can let God give you the peace in it. The other one's called relational storms. We can relate to this because we're relational people. And we have relationships with everybody. And I'm looking for the person who says, I've never had a relational storm because I'm going to look at you and say that you've lived in a cave by yourself. And you've never met a human being because no matter who it is that you're with, there is a relational storm. It's called mom and dad and children, siblings and husbands and wives and friends. You pick it 
You choose it. We've all been in them. And in those relational storms that are beyond your control, we have a choice, be it peace or panic. We try to fix it or let God be the God of it all. And if you remember last Sunday's sermon, I, I made the comment, you putting your finger in the pie trying to help God always mucks it up. So let's not help God out in that sense. Let's let God be sovereign of these storms that we're in and learn to be at peace in the midst of it. The third one are called emotional storms. Emotional storms are those storms that come, I like to call them the secret storms. No one really sees them, but they're there inside of you. You know, maybe, you know, it's something going on with work and you can't change it. And it's creating a storm in your emotion. Maybe it's somebody that you know. Maybe it's a marriage or a friendship or a family member or an employer or an employee. It's somebody that is creating an internal storm within your heart that no one knows about and rarely does it erupt. And when it does erupt out, it's kind of like when the Mississippi banks break and it creates flooding, it creates damage. Same thing for you and I. In these emotional storms, we need to remember that God is sovereign over that storm and he can bring a peace into our hearts. You know, not everybody's going to do it the way Gregory Scott Benson wants it done. And if there's anything that Gregory Scott Benson has learned over the years of Christendom, is that I'm not in control. There are things that I like done in a certain way. But you know what? I've learned over the years, it's not going to always happen the way I want, and it's not a big deal. Unless it's an issue of loss or of limb or life, who cares? Let it go. In other words, Greg, we have to learn not to be controlling. And if I can learn it, guess what? You can too. So let's not do that. Let's not create storms of our own making. Let's be at peace. The other thing that you need to understand about storms is that they're, they, they're going to happen. And everybody out there is going, duh. Good. You need to remember that. You, you do not be taken surprised by a storm coming. You know, we went out the other day and my beloved car had a flat. That's a storm. Now we got to get the car flat changed. It's all kinds of little things that happen in life that kind of knock so both. But we're also talking the big things of life. We're talking medical diagnoses. We're talking losing family members. We're talking loss of relationships, marriages, divorces. We can name the life-changing impact storms that happen. I mean, we categorize hurricanes from one to five. And I remember the year I went to Bible college, I actually went through three hurricanes on my journey. And I'll never forget that. So when you got a hurricane one category hurricane, it's a big deal. We got a hurricane five. That is like, oh, man. All you have to do is remember Hurricane Katrina that hit Louisiana, and New Orleans, changed the absolute fabric of southern, southern Louisiana. So the storms are going to happen. They're a part of life. They develop a character. They develop a, a understanding of God. They develop a peace that as you go through them, you become more a person of peace and you get to share that peace with everybody else. So it's not like I go through these storms and I'm holding them all together and I see, you know, a good friend of mine going through it and I don't say anything. I'm going to encourage them. I'm even going to look at people that, that go through storms and that I meet in the ER because, you know, everybody going into the ER has a storm. And I'm going to tell them, you know, God can give you peace. It doesn't matter to me if they're a Christian or not. I'm going to tell them God is the one that will give them peace because that is where peace is found. Whatever peace that we're trying to find in this world is fleeting. Fleeting means it's there and gone. There and gone. The minute the circumstance changes, it's gone. you got to get it back again. That type of worldly peace is a temporary peace temporal event. The peace I'm talking about is an eternal event that is always there if we look to the one who is our peace. So if you want to look at the world and your friends to give you peace, hey, I can't control that. But I can tell you that peace is fleeting. If you want to look at the Savior, 
who is the one that calms the storms, you'll have eternal peace. That's what I would encourage you to do. The second thing is they're unpredictable. They're going to happen and they're unpredictable. They're not on a timeline. They're not on your timeline. They're not on my timeline. How many times have you gotten in the car to go somewhere and you're late? Why? You couldn't find something? The children are running around. You got them all dressed up. And you said, okay, stay in this area. Stay clean. And the next thing you know, they got lipstick over their face. They fell in the mud. They did something. Now you're in a time storm. Storms are unpredictable. In the Sea of Galilee, they were unpredictable. And even though we have weather abilities today, and you can turn on the channel and see the news, you're going to be in heat for the next 12 days. And they're showing you the heat dome and all that over the Southern California, Southwest area of the country. That weather pattern can change like that. If you grew up in Tornado Alley, you know what I'm talking about. It could be blue outside. The next thing you know, a siren's going off saying a tornado is coming. So understand something. It's unpredictable and it's impartial. Oh, you don't like that one no more than I did. It's impartial. Though I'm a pastor, doesn't mean I don't escape the storms. Though I've been a Christian for 50 years, doesn't escape the storms. Though I may understand theology and doctrine and read Greek and all that neat stuff, doesn't mean that I'm going to escape the storm. It's impartial. That means the saved and the unsaved, the mature Christian, the immature Christian, the new Christian, and the Christian that is older, that is all everybody gets it. It's impartial. So let me give you a storm that we all have, the storm of aging. One time I had a lot of hair on my head, and it was dark. Some of you know that. Now I don't have as much, and it's great. The storm of aging, you know, your body changes. There's storms everywhere. But Jesus is your peace. I can't stress that to you. They're impartial. So don't look at you and say, why am I getting it? Don't whine and moan and groan. Trust the God that loves you. Don't complain about it. Don't go waking him up going, hey, don't you care? I'm drowning. He does care. He's there. Jesus is sound asleep. If there's an example for you and I, we ought to take a nap. In fact, I remember we had a hurricane uh, that hit Rhode Island years ago, years, early in my pastorate. And the family is running around looking out all the windows as the hurricane's coming up Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island. What did I do? I took a nap. Jesus did. Why not? I took a nap. I wasn't worried and fretting about it. I knew God would take care of us. And he did. The church got damaged. But we took care of that. Not a big deal. You know, things happen. But you can be at peace. I can either be at peace or I can panic. In fact, here's the interesting thing that you can get out of this. The Greek word for storm here is seismo. It's where we get seismograph. In other words, it's the very same word that we get for earthquakes. So the Greek word found here is what we use today to measure earthquakes, including the one that hit Manhattan Beach at 6.11 this morning. It was a 3.0. So Southern California has earthquakes all the time. And they have these devices that measure the earthquake, that English word that we use comes from this Greek word that we find here in the Bible, indicating that this storm was more than just a storm. It was a storm that was shaking everything. And I would like to use it in a spiritual sense to say we face storms that shake our spiritual being. But yet God is sovereign and does not change. He is immutable, does not change. He is the rock. Hatisar does not change and loves you and I no different than he loved the disciples. So I can be a panic or I can be at peace when I face a storm because the fact of the matter is the storm's going to be that. You know, 
we could even say this, God, I don't know how you're going to work this out, but I'm going to go to bed and leave it to your hands. That has been a prayer of mine many times at night when I have faced storms that are relational, that are circumstantial, that are situational, that are unexpected. And I've gone to bed with that prayer. I don't know how you're going to work this out, God. But you do. Put a peace in my heart that I may sleep. And God is faithful to meet us where we're at, always. I'd like to say this. I'd like for you to write it down. God is aware. He knows what's going on. God is here. He is omnipresent. And God is near. God is aware of what's going on in your life. He hasn't forgotten you. He, he doesn't put you on the back burner. He's not like what we do to people. You know, they call us, they text us, and we don't respond. When we call God, he answers. When we text God, he answers. God always answers us. He is always here, wherever you're at. And he's always near, wherever you're at. So God is aware. God is here. And God is near. No matter how big the wave is, no matter how great the storm is, Jesus has the power to rebuke it. And he can do that for you and I. The question, Mark, is, are we going to respond to him in a way that builds our faith? Or are we going to allow these storms that are going to happen? Remember what I told you. They're going to happen. They're unpredictable and they're impartial. They don't care who you are. You cannot read the Bible enough to not have storms. But you can have a peace. Panic indicates you have no clear thought. That's what panic means. I have met patients who are panicking. And when they panic, they're not in the right mind. They are everywhere. They're going left, right. They're over-talking us. They're not listening. We're trying to help them, take care of them. There is no peace. And when there is no peace, we can't do what we need to do in an emergency department. And that is true of even parenting with a child. When your child is panicking, they're not listening. When you and I choose to panic, we're not listening. When we choose to take it on and allow the storm to grip our heart, then we are no longer listening to the one who is our savior and will save us in the midst of the storm, the one who can declare peace. A peace that, according to Ephesians, no man understands. That's the peace that he has. Not a temporal peace, not a temporary peace, but a deep abiding peace within our hearts that holds dearly to us in the midst of the storm. And if he wants to, he can remove the storm like that. Poof, it's gone. So instead of looking for other things to help you cope with the storm, alcohol, drugs, relationships, shopping, that's a big one. I'm in the middle of a storm. I'll go shop. Instead of or eating, there's another one. I have a giant storm. All I'm going to do is eat. All those things don't resolve the storm. He resolves the storm. He's the one capable of giving you a peace today in your storm if you want him to. If you ask him to, he will give you a peace that no man understands. Look what happened in the story. He woke up. Peace, be still. And the storm that was all over the Sea of Galilee was no more. And it impacted everybody around. So as I bring this message to conclusion, I want you to think about this one point. When you're in the midst of a storm and you're, on, you're doing it your way, then that means everybody around you is impacted by that storm. Your behavior changes, your verbiage changes, your mentality changes, your heart changes. It can become an angry heart, a bitter heart, a resentful heart, a proud heart, a controlling heart. It can become a heart 
that is depressed, discouraged, despondent, disillusionment, what I call the dirty D's, and thus everybody around you is impacted. And you say, no, 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 that's not true. Yes, it is true. The Bible says that when Saul, before he became Paul, was going to Damascus, that the very air in the Greek, the very air around Saul was angry. The very air, I mean, the very air was angry. And I would tell you that when we are in this storms, whatever they may be, of our own making or not, when we are in control, trying to hold the rudder, trying to do it our way, we are impacting everybody that is around us. Or when that storm comes, you can look to the Lord, who is your sovereign God, who has hand on the rudder, take yours off, let him be in charge, be at peace. And that peace is seen by everybody around you. So you can either affect people negatively or you can affect people positively. You can either affect people to, to push them away from God because they're looking at you going, well, wait, you're a Christian and this is what you're doing. Or you can affect people that because of the storm, you're at peace and they're going, wow, you got something I don't have. So what are you going to do? Because like I told you, storms happen. They're unpredictable and they're impartial. There are many different types of storms. What are you going to do when the storm comes? And one of the things I would encourage you is if you know anything about the Mississippi River, you know that the major rivers are uncontrollable. Mankind builds dikes and, and levees to control the river. But the river has a way of breaking it all down. And so if you look at the Mississippi River that runs north-south on our country, you'll find that the Army Corps of Engineers is constantly building up the levees. And they have to constantly keep an eye on it because if they don't, the river will make its way through to do what it wants to do. And the analogy there would be this. Stay in worship. Stay in prayer. Stay reading your Bible, stay in fellowship. Those four principal points, worship, prayer, Bible, fellowship, are all equally important. You can't just worship and not read your Bible. You can't just pray and not worship. You can't just fellowship, not pray, read your Bible, and all the rest. Of it. Build up the levees that are protective in nature, that when the storm comes, Jesus has a greater means of moving through you and keeping you secure, and you don't freak out and panic as they did. And thus, Jesus would not look at you and say, where's your faith? He is Lord of everything, and he will walk you through the storms if you let him. Notice I said it doesn't mean he's going to remove it. He's either going to be in it with you, or he's going to Take it away. Say or be. But he'll never abandon you in the storm. Like we abandon people when they are in storms. And that is a no-go for a Christian. We don't abandon anybody in the midst of the storm. So it doesn't matter how good you are, or how bad you are. It doesn't matter how much you know or you don't know. What matters is who is Lord. And if he's Lord... Take your hands off things and let him be Lord. Stop trying to be in control. That's a word to all of us who are control nuts or controlling. I have controlling personalities. We need to be at peace to let him be in charge. And that includes every type of storm, financial, relational, job, children, family, Friends, dogs, cats, animals, I don't care. Whatever storm it may be, let him be Lord and be at peace. I encourage you this morning. The temporary storms, listen to me, the temporary storms, I'll say it again, the temporary storms 
The heat wave that we're under right now is going to end. By next Saturday, it's supposed to be 79. Right now, it's not. It's a storm. It's hot. The main area is melting. Okay? It's a temporary storm. I like to say it this way. When I used to be with the Marines and we would do these military hikes, we called them humps. And you're going 24 miles with combat gear and everything. And it's 24 miles at normally about a three mile an hour pace up and down hills and mountains and everything else. It is painful. I learned two lessons in it. Number one, don't ever look at how many miles I had to go. Just look at the guy in front of me. And three, I would, uh, two, sorry, I would count one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, for 24 miles. So all I did was exist on a four count and the guy in front of me to make it. Because I did know it would end. What I didn't want to know is how long it took. And I already knew it would take eight hours. But I would rather not look at my clock and I would rather not look way ahead. I would rather look at the guy in front of me and count a four count, and I made it through every hump. That was my methodology, because I knew it would end. Other people said it this way in the military, when they went through rigorous training, I just looked to the next meal, because I knew at that meal I wouldn't be doing anything but eating. Some people say, I just look towards bedtime. Sometimes when I'm in the ER, all I'm thinking is, going to bed, and I'll start over again. Whatever it is that you need to do that helps you in that journey, you need to know the storm is temporary, and even though you're in the midst of it, you're not alone. He's with you. Last point, conclusion point. If we know a friend or family member is in a storm, don't abandon them. Don't correct them. Walk it through with them. It is not your moment in the middle of the storm to give them 93 points of theology. It's a time to encourage them that the Savior is with them and be with them. Hear me again. Too often in the middle of the storm, we're doing this. Well, if you had faith, if you understood God's truth, if you did it God's way, listen to me. They don't need to hear all that in the middle of the storm. Tell them that after the storm's over. That's called discipleship. But in the middle of the storm, notice what Jesus did. Peace be still. He resolved the problem. Then he addressed it. So let's be gracious. Learn to be gracious to those who are in storms. Don't belittle their storm. Don't sit there and look at them and go, well, I've had far worse times. Well, I remember back in 2010. No. Just simply be with them and love them the way Jesus does. Jesus doesn't look at us and go, well, the storm I had was on the cross. Let's be Christ-like and gracious to all who go through difficult times. Let's be encouraging and be loving. Let's be at peace. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time, this message. I pray the words would be words of life that would encourage us and help us in the midst of our storms, but also help those who are going through storms, that we would become a buoy that would build them up to you and not a barnacle that would drag them down. Help us to be Christ-like, to see that you are Lord of all. I ask you to bless everyone who hears this message and who has heard this message. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I pray that God's peace be with you and blessings. I'll see